he would go to the laver, which was a, a, a little tub there, a basin of water, where he could wash and cleanse himself because the blood would be on his hands because of the sacrifice. So he was able to come there and be washed and cleansed there. That's what we remember when we come to that next spot, that the cross has paid the price for us, and now I can come to God, and there's this moment where I need a washing and a cleansing from him. And that's what we want to do. We come in, because the Bible tells us we have to renew our minds and renew our spirits. There is this purifying that takes place. Yes, the cross paid my price, but there's still this part in me that needs to have this continual cleansing and purifying, this sanctification process that has to happen. So when you come there, you're remembering that, yes, the sacrifice has been paid, and I'm washed in the blood of Christ, and I'm cleansed from all my unrighteousness. But God, if there's any known sin inside of me, I ask you to forgive me and cleanse it of me of it now. Would you renew my mind, cleanse my mind? Renew my heart and cleanse my heart? How many of you know that's not just a once-a-day prayer? That's a moment-by-moment -moment prayer. Like there's this, what I call surrender intervals. Like you've got to learn what's your surrender interval. It cannot be every 48 to 36 hours. Like it needs to be, maybe it's every five minutes for you. Like you got to find what's that surrender interval where I capture those thoughts and I hand them to God and I surrender them to him. And I say, God, cleanse my mind. We live in a culture where our eyes are bombarded with images and things. Our ears are bombarded. There has got to be this renewing of the mind and the spirit to say, God, I just give you that. I ask you to cleanse me of it. And that's what this represents at the labor. This washing and this cleansing and this purifying. And what you're really doing at the labor is you're saying, God, would you produce in me the fruit of the Spirit? Would you produce in me the fruit of the Spirit? This old man becomes this new man. This old woman becomes this new woman in Christ. And I need to have these fruit of the Spirit produced in me. The Bible says this in Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. How many of you know those list of things is not natural? That is not a natural inclination of people. It is not in our natural DNA to be kind, to be peaceful, to be self-controlled and patient. It's not. Sadly, it's not to be loving. You don't have to look around very much to see that it is obviously not in people's DNA to be loving. We used to wear those WWJD braces. I shared this a while ago. I love them. We give them out sometimes. It's a great thing to remind yourself. But there's some new bracelets that say HWLF. He would love first. That's what he would do. Because Jesus is love. So his natural inclination was always love. If you read that scripture correctly, it actually says, for the fruit of the, not fruits, for the fruit of the Spirit is love. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Now, how does love pay it, play itself out? Through joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. But the fruit you want to see producing you is love. That's what begins to take shape as you cleanse. Say, God, would you fill me with your love? May I be love to everyone I go to. Let your joy and your peace and your patience and kindness and goodness, let that overflow in me. Cleanse me, God, and produce that in me. Now, here's what's amazing. After that's taken place, the priest can now enter the first veil. He could go into the next room. And I want you to see what happens and how God foreshadows everything and there's a purpose in it. The laver is here. He walks in the veil and here's what he does. He walks this way and makes a left-hand turn to the candlestick. There's a candlestick here where he's going to light those and the fire now illuminates. Fire in the Bible represents the Spirit of God. Acts chapter 2, it says, when the Holy Spirit fell, it fell like tongues of fire. This is for us in our prayer time to remember the power of the Holy Spirit. I've just asked him to produce the fruit of the Spirit in me, to cleanse me. I come to the candlestick to remember, now God, I need you to fill me with your power. I need you to fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. I need the gifts of the Spirit. What is it that you've placed inside of me that you can use to use me to go help other people? Hey, if you don't know what your gifts are and how God's gifted you, guess what you need to do? Go to Connect 3 today. So your next step. Your next step is to leave this, go into the teacher's lounge for Connect 3, and figure out how God's made you. He made you on purpose for a purpose. Go learn your gifts. Learn how he's given you talents and how you can use those for the kingdom. So you come to the candlestick to say, God, would you fill me with your spirit? Fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit and the gifts that come with that. Isaiah chapter 11 says this when we get the Holy Spirit. It says that the spirit of the Lord will rest on you. And then guess what happens? It's the spirit of wisdom 
and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Leave that out there for a little bit. I want you to see what happens here. That when you ask for the Spirit to fill you up, you receive this. Not only do you just receive more of the Holy Spirit, you get wisdom and understanding. You get counsel. How many of you know you need some counsel sometimes? When you're going to make a big decision, how about you don't call all your friends first? How about you go to Jesus first and ask him what he'd like you to do? Get some wise counsel from him first. Then seek wise counsel from others. But let the Spirit give you counsel. You know what that nudging is. That nudging when he's leading you to do something. It happened to me the other day. I was with Zoe at the Publix, and I was putting the cart away, and a lady doubled over at the cart area. She's like, oh, oh. And I heard somebody say, you all right? As I'm getting ready to put the cart, she goes, yeah. So I went to put my cart away. I said, are you, all, are you okay? She said, yeah, I have like stomach flu and just doubled over. I said, you sure you're good? She said, yes. And I slowly walked back to my car, and then I got in the car, and I closed the door, and Zoe said, what's wrong, Dad? I said, man, I should have prayed with that lady. That's that nudging that the Holy Spirit's going, come on. And a lot of times we squelch it because we get nervous. Look, I'm your pastor. I do the same thing. You go, what, you didn't pray for her? Aren't you a pastor? I didn't. Here's what I knew in that moment. I'm going, this is what my thought process was walking to the car, knowing that I am gone to the candlestick and I'm filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm walking back to my car going, you know what would be really cool? I bet if I prayed for her in this parking lot right now, she'd get healed and walk away completely healed. But that's what I thought. I thought, is that arrogant? No, I thought, no, that's the God I serve. Like, he's that powerful. Like, he could heal her right now in a public parking lot. But I didn't do it. I got in the car. But you need to know that when you're asking him to fill you up, he gives you counsel. He gives you wisdom. He gives you might. And then it says he gives you this fear of the Lord. That doesn't mean you walk around afraid lightning's going to strike you if you do something bad. Doesn't mean you walk around thinking God's going to punish you every time you do something. It is a healthy, reverent awe of who God is. It's this place of going, God, this is all about you. It's all for you. God, would you fill me up, Lord, because you are worthy and you are wonderful. And this is all for you. It's this healthy perspective of letting the Spirit fill you up. So I, he starts here. He walks up and he goes over to the candlestick. Then he turns around and makes his way across the room to what's called the table of showbread. S-E-H-E-W bread. Not like showtime, like show bread. And what this is, is it was these cakes that had been made, not for consumption, for you just to go over and eat bread because you're hungry when you're inside the tabernacle. It was as an offering to God, giving it to him. Now here's what we know about the term bread. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. So I, I'm the thing that's going to satisfy you most of all. But here's what we also know. God's word is referred to as bread, as something that you can consume, that you need to take in at all times. That's why it says in Jeremiah 15, 16, that when your words came to me, I ate them. And they were my joy and my heart's delight. You have to now come over here after saying, God, would you fill me up with your power? And now, Lord, can I get a fresh revelation from your word? Would you allow your word to speak to me? God, as I go to the Bible, as I read the word today, may it come alive. May it speak to me, Father. Let your word jump off the page and get into me. That's why you've got to memorize scripture and have it hidden in your, in your heart. The Bible says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That I've got it in there. It's not something I have to have on the app. Or I have it inside of me. Jeremiah says that your words came and I ate them. Like I consumed them. And they were my joy, my heart's delight. Psalm 119, 105 says, guess what? Your word, God, is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. You want to know where you're supposed to go, how he's guiding, how he's leading? You better get in the word and let him speak to you. So you've washed here saying, now produce the right spirit in me. He's come up and he's going over saying, now fill me with your power. I need that kind of spirit to rest on me because I can do nothing without it. I need your spirit and your power. Then I come over here and I say, and I need your word. May I consume it. May it be a revelation to me. May I take it in. God, speak to me through your word. And then he comes back and he walks right back up the middle to the altar of incense. Does anyone know what the priest has just done without even knowing it? He has walked the cross. He has walked the process of the cross, foreshadowing what would come thousands of years later. From here, to the left, to the right, up the middle. You want to know why in the church they do this and they genuflect? Because it is a representation of walking that process. It is the cross. He has walked it. The priest has modeled what's going to happen. And he comes to the altar of incense. 
which is worship. Here's what the Holy Spirit revealed to me during the volunteer time. Do you know what's amazing about the altar of incense? The altar of incense is lit with coals from the brazen altar. How amazing that it's because of the sacrifice of Jesus that I can freely worship. It's the coals from the brazen altar that light the altar of incense to give him worship. It's because of the sacrifice of Jesus, I can now offer worship, offer praise to him, lift him up, and it's a sweet aroma to him. So you got to know that when you've been filled with his power and you want his word, you come to this place where you worship God in your prayer time. Lord, I just want to worship you. Maybe you need to cut worship music on during that time. Just worship him. Give him praise and work. God, you're so worthy of worship. You know what you should do sometime? I, I just started doing this recently. Have you ever studied the names of God? He has multiple names. And those names are something very specific that you may need at a specific time. So as you worship, worship his names. I'm going to teach you some of these. If you need to take a picture of the screen or write them down, like learn some of these. Maybe you need him to be Jehovah Rapha, which is a healer. He's the God say, God, you heal me. Like, I, I worship you, Jehovah Rapha. Heal me right now. I need you to be healer in my life. Maybe you need him to be Jehovah Ra, which is a shepherd. Like, God, I need you to lead me. I got a lot of big decisions coming up. I'm not sure. Like, would you be the God who leads me right now? Maybe you need him to be Jehovah Jireh, which is the God who provides. He's a provider. He supplies all your needs. Like, God, I just want to know that you're Jehovah Jireh right now, that you will provide every one of my needs. Maybe you need him to be Jehovah Shalom. He is the God of peace. And he will be peace in every storm that you have. Maybe you're in the middle of a storm right now. Maybe if you pray this way, when you get to this part of the prayer, take time just to go, God, I'm believing on it. I can't see it right now. There's turmoil around me. There's crazy stuff going on. But you are Jehovah Shalom. You are the God of peace. You will be peace. Like, declare it. Worship him. Maybe you need him to be Jehovah Shema, which is he's simply there. He is with you. God, would you be there with me? God, you are always with me, and I worship you because of that. You never leave me. You never forsake me. Maybe you need him to be Adonai, which is simply your Lord and your master, letting you know that you belong to God. That's something somebody needs to remember right now. There is nothing you can do that will make God love you more, and there is nothing you can do that will make God love you less. He simply loves you because he made you on purpose for a purpose. You belong to him. He wants you to know that. He is Adonai for you. Let him be that. Maybe you need to go back to the really old, ancient Hebrew. Call him El Elyon, which he is the Most High God. Worship him as the Most High God. El Shaddai, he is the Almighty God. Look, there are so many other names. These are just a few, but what would it look like if in your prayer time you begin to worship him like this? Thank you, God, that you are Jehovah Rapha. You heal me. I need a healing right now. Like, worship him. And after the priest has walked this path, left, right, to the middle, and he's worshipped God, he now can enter the Holy of Holies. But listen, let me tell you something that's incredible about the incense that happens there. There are only two times in the Bible that are referenced as incense as this aroma to God. Do you know what they are? They're prayer and praise, and they're giving. Giving. Uh-oh. I knew it. I got to church. The pastor told me I'm giving. I knew he'd get there eventually. Listen to me real quick. That's why we do the offering part of our service as a part of our worship experience. Because it's just as much worship as it is singing songs. It's just as much worship as it is praying, as hearing the word. Like, it is this offering to God that's a sweet aroma to him. Like, listen, God doesn't need your money. What? This is the greatest church ever. Hear me. This is not a like God's going, look, we're getting low on money up here. I need you guys to give 10% or this thing's going down quick. It's not what he's doing. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the streets up there are made of gold. If God wants to end debt in America, he just has to shake the dust off of heaven. He doesn't need your money. It is an act of obedience and faith. And it is an act of worship. To go, God, you have freely given to me everything. None of this is my own doing. At a moment, you could take me out like that. This is all for you. And so I freely give you back a portion of what you've freely given me. That's why he's only asking for 10%. Best deal on the planet. I gave you 100. You give me 10. I'll bless the other 90. But when you hold on to all of it, I can't bless any of it. I can't. 
And you want to know why some people are struggling financially? It is not a magic pill. I have very rarely, if ever, seen someone that is a biblical tither struggling financially. I haven't. Doesn't mean they're living a life of luxury. They're rolling deep. It means that they are serving going, oh, he's Jehovah Jireh. He's the God who provides. So if I freely give to him, he'll provide everything I need. I'm telling you, test it. See if it's not true. I promise you. I've lived like this my entire life. I have never gone in lack, and I've tithed every day since Aaron and I have been married. We give that first 10%. Boom, you can have it, God. It's yours. Because it's a sweet aroma to him of worship and incense. And he blesses it. The Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 13. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. The fruit of lips that only profess his name. So the priest has washed, fill me up, give me your word. I'm praising and worshiping you. And now he can enter the Holy of Holies. Now he goes in behind the veil to the Holy of Holies where the mercy seat is. He goes to the mercy seat. And you know what this is? This is intercession. This is where the priest goes in to offer the prayers for the people, the atoning prayers, praying on behalf of the people. Jesus is our great high priest. He sits at the right hand of the Father, not stands. His work is done. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. Notice that nothing in the tabernacle prayer has ever been about us in the beginning. I praise him. I enter his course of thanksgiving. I offer a sacrifice and thank him for the cross, the work he did that I couldn't do. I ask him to purify me, keep me right. I want him to purify my mind. That's all about you, God, filling me up. Give me your power. I need your word. I worship you, and now I can come and offer prayers. Too many of us, man, we enter that gate. We blow right by thankfulness. We just enter the gate. We're like, all right, God, I'm pretty busy. I need you to do all of this for me. Please take this whole list and do it. Amen. And we have bypassed the whole process of the tabernacle to get to him where we can offer those prayers. Look, this prayer is not a quick 30-second thing where you just go, okay, God, I've got a busy day today. I've got a lot of meetings. I need you to do all this. I need a lot of money and a lot of blessings and a lot of favor. I need you just to give me everything I need. In Jesus' name, amen. And then at the end of the day, when you haven't gotten everything you need, you get mad. He didn't do it. I didn't win the lottery. I knew I was supposed to. I've been praying for the lottery for three years, and he still hasn't done it for me. He was supposed to heal this person. He was supposed to do that. I was supposed to have that relationship and these kids and that house. And when God doesn't do things the way you want him to do, you get mad at God when he's going, I'm still waiting back here at the gate. Let's walk the process together. Then when you get here, offer those prayers up to me. Because once I've gone through that, I've given that proper perspective, I come to God and I say, all right, God, I want to intercede. I want to pray for my kids. God, I pray for my spouse. I pray for those family members that are far from you. God, I want to pray for my church. Hear me as your pastor. I would love it if you would pray for my family and I. Like, it, it's the greatest gift you can give us. Like, I don't know if you do that or not, but I would love that. We get hit from a lot of different sides. Satan throws a lot of arrows and a lot of daggers at us, and we can feel the prayers when people are praying for us. You're called to do that, to pray for your pastors and pray for your leaders. Pray for your ministry leader. Maybe you serve somewhere at Limitless Church. I hope you're praying for your leader. Pray for your Limitless group leader. You're going to join a group today. Everybody's going back to that table after service and signing up for a group. Everyone, get in a group. Life change happens in a group. Trans go get in a group. Do life with people. You're not a Lone Ranger Christian. Go get in a group and do life with somebody. There are nine groups, probably a tenth one coming. There's plenty of places for you to jump in. I'm leading a Monday morning guys group I've been leading. It's incredible. But I'm doing something that God really impressed on Aaron and I's hearts this year. I said, look, I want to pour into young leaders. I want to take the next generation. So Aaron and I on Sunday nights are taking all college kids and young adults that are single. Sorry, married couples. We have married groups. Go get in one. We're taking young adults that are single and all these college kids and let us pour into them. Come into our home. Do life with us. Let us pour into you. There's women's groups and men's groups. There's a prayer walk and there's Bible studies. Like, go get in a group and do life with people. But pray for them. Pray for your church family. Pray for one another. Guess what else you're supposed to do in this intercession time? Pray for those who are in authority. <gasps> what? Yes. You're called to pray for those in authority which means people in government and those in high places. I don't like their policies. Pray for them. I don't like the way they do things. Pray for them. Don't get on there and rant and rave on Facebook in different places. I've never seen that change anything. Do you know what it does? When you pray. If my people will pray, then I'll do something. Get on your face before God. Look, I read the whole Bible. Do you know what's happened sometimes? Nebuchadnezzar going to do this. Prayers happen, does this. 
It wasn't because Daniel went, hey, dude, don't be throwing people in the furnace, man. You need to quit doing that. No, no, no. They worshiped God, and they praised him, and they, they survived. Hey, you can't pray. You get thrown in the, in the lion's den. Well, I'm going to keep praying. Throw me in the lion's den. Guess what? Shut the mouths of the lions. And Nebuchadnezzar goes, okay, that's the one true God. I promise you, if you'll pray for those people in authority, they'll walk into meetings going, here's the policy that I don't want to do anymore. And I don't know why. No idea why I don't want to do that anymore. But I think we should do this. Nobody's talked to me. What in the world? That's the power of God. When you pray, pray for your boss. What? Yes, pray for your boss. Pray for those in leadership above you. Pray for those in authority. Pray for them. Don't pray this. God, would you strike them down? Or would you just strike them? No, it's not the prayer. Here's a crazy prayer. God, would you bless them? I don't want them to be blessed. God, bless them. Give them favor. Give them wisdom. God, just bless them. Look, I'm telling you, this will change your prayer life. Pray for somebody. And then at the end, bring those needs that you have before God. And God, here's what I'd like you to do in my life. God, here's what, here's what I need. Lord, I got a job interview coming up this week, and I'm super nervous about it. And God, would you fill me with peace? And would you be Jehovah Shalom in my life and give me peace as I walk? Like, give him your needs. And then when you've done that, finish with this, just like we did in the Lord's Prayer. Because God, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And I worship you, God, and I celebrate you, God. And you're worthy of it, and you're going to do what you said you would do. Amen. And worship him. I promise you, this, this process has changed my prayer life. As you leave today, we have these sheets that you can take with you. That's all of the tabernacle prayer that you can walk through it. It has a picture of the tabernacle. It has everything on there. Every one of these steps is in there. Some scriptures are on there. Take it and pray it. We're going to have them for you as you walk out. Take that with you. And this week, I'd encourage you, pray like this at least three times this week. Pray like this. Take it and do the tabernacle prayer and watch what God will do inside of you. But as we wrap up today, here's the hard part. You'll never receive the full power of the tabernacle prayer because some of you have only walked in the gate and you've stopped at the brazen altar every time. So you've come in the gate and gone, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm here, but that piece right there, the, the, the sacrifice piece, like I've never fully accepted what Jesus did on the cross for me. And you'll never be able to get to the laver and the candlestick and the showbread and the altar of incense into the mercy seat until you receive the sacrifice that was paid for you on the cross. And if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, today is a great day to do that so you can begin the journey of life with him. Every eye closed, every head bowed. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, we want to give you that opportunity right now. All you have to do is simply raise your hand on the count of three. Nobody's looking around. This is your moment with God. We just want to know who we're rejoicing with the angels in heaven. One, it's a great day to come to Jesus. Two, he's waiting for you. Three, if that's you, raise your hand long enough for me to see it. If you say, I want to give my life to Christ, thank you for that. Anybody else say, that's me. Anybody else say, I want, to, I want a relationship with Jesus. Thank you for that. And for the rest of us, as we leave here today, I pray we walk out with a new vision and a new way to come to the throne of grace, to come before the Father in prayer. Hey, if you raise your hand or you wanted to, we're all going to say a prayer together right now. Maybe it's your first time even praying. We're all going to do it together so you don't feel signaled out or alone. Everybody repeat after me. Say, Jesus. Come on, say, Jesus. We love you. Thank you for loving us. Enough to die for my sins. I ask you to come into my life. Forgive my sins. I want a relationship with you. I give you my life. You can have it all, Lord. Save me. Lord, I thank you for everybody who prayed that prayer for the first time, a rededication, whatever the case may be. Lord, we rejoice with the angels in heaven of those who step from death into life. But God, I thank you that you are our great high priest, and we can walk the journey that every priest did before in the tabernacle as a way to come before you in prayer. Lord, we love you. We celebrate you. We give you all the glory and all the honor and all of God's people said. Come on, all of God's people said. Hey, church, we love you. Come on, give them some praise.